Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how I painted this long haired cat in acrylics. So in the introduction photo there you saw the reference photo in the lower left corner. Now there you can see that I have changed the background and I've added some grass in the foreground. And because my Patreon does also focus on the pet portrait side of things for members who do want to take on commissions themselves, I wanted to show that you can be given a reference photo where a client might ask how to change that background, whether or not it's possible to have something completely different and create a unique portrait. So this was exactly one of my main aims, as I say, for this painting. I have added with my airbrush that lovely soft green and blue background to replicate the foliage that would be in the distance. At the end here of this video you're going to then see how I added in the grass separately. But as I say for this I wanted to make sure here that I, I did show my Patreon members how you can go about changing that background photo from the original reference that you have. Now my biggest tip when you are doing this or you've been asked to do this is do make sure that the background that you have chosen does match the proportions and perspective of the subject. For instance, this cat here, the reference photo, the, the person who took this was at their eye level, so they were lower down on the ground. If I had a background where it was taken more at a raised angle of a scenery, you know, trees or anything like that, even the foliage, you want to make sure that it is on the same level. It would otherwise look very obvious that the background and the subject are completely different images, which of course is not what we want. Now, if you would like to see all of this tutorial in, you know, significantly slower footage, most of it is in real time. The 10 hour tutorial is available over on Patreon now. I've split that into two parts, but both parts are live. You get the reference photo and the line art for members who do want to paint along. So once I'd got done with the background, what I then did is I started with the face. Now you know here that I always start off with the eyes first on any subject. I think it's one of the most important elements. It's the soul where most of the expression stems from. And this cat had beautiful reflections and patterns within the eye that I really wanted to make sure I got right. So again, that's another reason why I want to start with the eyes. If the eyes aren't correct and then I move on to another part of the painting, it's never going to feel right. So it's one of those elements where I want to get 100% make sure that I'm really happy with it there might be a few final details I add to the eyes later on but once I know I'm happy with them that's when I start painting in the fur so if you've seen any of my other videos here on YouTube, you'll know that I put a lot of focus on the base layers. I do my very first foundation layer and then I do an additional layer of refinement on top. This is a layer here where I think it adds so much more depth to the fur. If ever I have left out this layer just to see what it might look like, there is nowhere near the same amount of depth as when I have included these first two layers. They, for me, are really important. Once I've got those layers in place, it is just a matter of building up my layers gradually. Now, depending on the subject that I'm painting, the fur texture I'm trying to create, there is going to be a slight difference in the approach. But predominantly for this, I was working from dark to light. So I want to make sure that I'm mapping in the layers that are closest to the skin and building up from there. One element as well that this tutorial on Patreon focuses on is colour. It's one of the most common questions that I'm asked on YouTube and Patreon and about how to mix your colours, how do you know what colour should go where. This is something that can really hold us back so I do make sure that I try and make the colour selection as easy as I possibly can in my own paintings. For, for instance, when I'm working on the very few layers of detail here, I'm not focusing on any kind of colour at all. You'll notice that the fur is all pretty much one colour, one tonal range. Here I'm going to start building up my tonal value, so what I mean by that is I'm going to build up my highlights gradually, as I've mentioned, working from dark to light, but the colour, not worried about it at this stage. I can adjust it very easily at the end. And by using this layering technique here with these putting your details in first and then working with glazes later on you don't have to stress or worry about color at all you could if you wanted to do a painting in black and white or a sepia tones and then add all of your color in separately at your final layers so again if that is something that is of interest to you i will link my patreon in the description below if this or any of my other tutorials are of interest so I have a video here on YouTube and it's my top tips for painting realistic fur in acrylics and I will link that in the description below if that's of interest.
One of the things there that I talk about is using various brushes for the fur texture. And this is something you can see that I'm working on at the moment. I've used multiple brushes to try and get the different types of texture at the various layers and the levels that they are at. One thing that can happen is if you use the same paintbrush for the first layer all the way up to your details, the fur can end up looking quite flat, two-dimensional. So what I like to do is use two or three different brushes to try and capture that texture, to try and get as much depth and realism in my paintings as I possibly can. And in the Patreon tutorial, you see that I'm using one specific type of brush. Now this brush I absolutely love and I do think it's one of the ones that I'm going to be using now on so many more paintings. I think it's been able to capture that much more realism than I've been able to create in my previous work. Now the brush here that I'm talking about is a rake brush, but the rake brush that I found, because I've used a couple of different brands, they certainly vary. The ones here that I've been using, they really have been so much more softer, they've been easier to use. However, in order to get them to work in the way that they are designed, I have found that it's about how you hold them, the way that you use it in terms of which part of the brush you use, and also the consistency of the paint. If you have any of those things slightly unbalanced or you're not quite holding it in the right way, you're not using it at the right angle, you can end up creating quite flat, very much like fur that's all in a set row. And that's one of the complications that can happen when you work with a rake brush. So again, this is one of those areas where I go into it in depth so that I can really show you what to do and what not to do because it's one of the brushes that can cause quite a lot of frustration. However, once it's mastered and it really just is a, you know, spend a half an hour or so just practicing with that brush. Once you've got that and you've got that understanding of how much water versus paint is required, they are so easy to use but make such a difference. Rake brushes, depending on how they're used, can end up making the fur look really quite fake looking because of how the fur strokes end up looking like they're in straight rows, as I've mentioned. So I do want to make sure here that I am really staggering and using that brush in different ways to get that variation. If you look at the fur above the eye to the left hand side, you wouldn't really know there that I've used a rake brush. It looks like I've painted in all of those details individually. And it's because of how I've been using this brush, how I've been holding it, the parts of the bristles that I've been using intentionally that's been able to give me that realistic variation in that fur. So on Patreon, I do regular polls where members could vote for their favourite reference photo, which will feature in an upcoming tutorial. This cat is the one that got the most votes on the latest poll. And one of the areas that I really wanted to focus on was the soft outer focus fur on the body. In the original reference photo, the body on the right hand side was significantly out of focus and then as it got across to the left hand side, it became more sharper. I really wanted to make sure that I got that difference in texture, that really sharp in focus face and the softer body. So for this, it required quite a different layering approach and a different blending technique. Now one thing as well that I always include in my Patreon tutorials, if I make a mistake or I make a layer that I don't like, I will always leave that in my tutorial. The reason being, we all make mistakes, it happens pretty much on every painting, but what's important to know is how to fix it. So if I can provide that information in the tutorials, hopefully then members, if they do make that mistake, there's no panic involved and they know how to fix it. And this is one of the things that I was finding quite frustrating in this painting. When I was layering the white fur here, I added a couple of layers that made the process longer. Now at the time I thought, oh, I shouldn't have done that layer. I've potentially gone back a step, but it never really entered my mind that I'd have to start the painting again. I always recommend continue with that painting and finish it. Any project that you've done, regardless of the medium, if you're not happy with it, still finish it if you can, because you learn from the mistakes that you've done previously. And what I had done here, as I've said, is I'd added a couple of layers. I didn't really like the softness that I was trying to create here, but there was no big deal. I just had to wait for that layer to dry and paint over it. I either used a glaze to soften out that fur, or as I'm doing here, I'm tinting it with my airbrush. Now where I am using my airbrush, I always say what to do if you're using traditional brushwork. And really here I was using my airbrush because I was experimenting with a new paint that I had just got ordered. But I did of course reference the colours that I would be mixing in the paints that I was using if I was doing these glazes with my brushes, just as I have done with the glazes on the face. 
When painting a complex fur texture like this, it's very easy to put far too much pressure on ourselves and be stressing about every detail being in the right place. I like to go for photorealism in my artwork, which means that you can still tell mine is a painting, but that I use that reference photo for it. So for this, all I want to do is make sure that I get the clumps of fur in approximately the right place. Am I worried that they're to within the millimetre exactly, you know, spot on to that reference photo? No, but I do want to go for close. And the one thing that's really important to remember, this cat could get up sit down and have another photo taken and the curls and the way that the fur here on the chest is presented is going to be slightly different. Now if you're going for hyperrealism then yes you do want to make sure that everything is perfect. You know with hyperrealism you should have the artwork and the reference photo side by side and no one should be able to tell the difference from which is the painting and which is the photo. For me I, know I have loads of respect for people that do that but I just don't like spending that length of time on one piece. So for me photorealism is what I want to go for. A misconception when painting white fur is that we don't have to spend as much time on it because we think of it as one colour. But that really isn't the case. As you can see here, I'm actually spending more time on the white fur than I have the face. Just because we think of it as one colour doesn't mean that it doesn't require the same amount of layers. With white fur, we have all of those very subtle tonal variations that we have to include in order to make that white fur look realistic. Also, white fur is very reflective, so you are going to potentially have colours from the environment, other reflected bounce light that's captured within those clumps of fur. So if you can see that in that reference photo, it is important to add it because again, it will help to build up more depth within that fur. And you often hear me speak about on the other YouTube videos about painting what is behind elements first. So at the moment here, I'm now adding the very final details of the fur on the side of the face. I couldn't add those at the time because I hadn't painted in the white fur that was behind it. So to save time in me painting over my details, it's always important to make sure that you paint whatever is behind a detail first, and then you can overlap those details on top. It's going to save you time and, you know, means that you're not adding in details, which you know you're going to have to paint over and then reinforcing them later on. Once I've done that, as you can see there, the very last thing that I add to the animal is the whiskers. The reason being, the whiskers overlap everything else, so we want to make sure that we add those last. If we add them in a little early on, and we then realise we haven't finished the fur behind it, we're going to have to paint around the whiskers, and that really does make our life so much more difficult, and then the painting process longer. So I already have a tutorial on Patreon showing you how to paint grass, but basically there are a few main things here that I want to make sure that I capture. The first being that I've got a variation of the green tones that I am using. You want to start off with a minimum of three. You want a dark green, a mid green, and then a highlighted green. I usually work between six and eight types of greens. It doesn't really matter the exact green I'm going for, but I do want that variety of the tonal values. You might want to throw in some yellows, some browns, and have a really nice mixture of colours, because as you know, not all grass is going to be the same colour. And shown here in a photo of the finished painting, you can see that colour variation and the tonal ranges I've got within the grass. But also, as well, just as importantly, I've got the variation in the length. All of the grass strokes that I've painted there are different. They curve in different ways and they are, as I've said, also various lengths. So two of those things are one of the two biggest elements to consider when painting grass. So I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared here in this tutorial were useful. If they were, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And as I've mentioned, if my slower tutorials in pastels and acrylics are of interest, I will link my Patreon in the description below. I also have a Patreon library on my website which lists all of the tutorials that are immediately available as soon as you sign up. So if you've got any questions, anything art related, pop them in the comments below. I am more than happy to help. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'm going to be uploading another video here at the weekend.